<laughs> so did you sleep okay? Oh, so well. It was beautifully and toasty warm, thanks to the Essel's heat pumps. Lovely hot shower, loads of hot water, mixergy tanks. And my car was charged to 90%. Oh, I mean, what more could you ask for? We are staying at a zero carbon bed and breakfast in Rye in the south of England. And this is the Everything Electric Show. We're here at Magnolia House in Rye, a zero carbon bed and breakfast, which is powered entirely by the wind and sun. Now this building was originally built in 1910, but in 2019, Javid and his wife Judith, they bought the property, have spent time rebuilding it and installing a load of clean energy technologies. Many of which we have actually featured on the channel before, but never in this particular combination and certainly not for a property of this size. And there are a couple of bits that we've never featured on the channel before, so we're really excited to go and take a look. So 2019, that means that you had an exceptionally busy lockdown. Yes, that wasn't planned. The building work started two weeks after the first lockdown was announced. And the nine month project then took me the full two years over lockdown, where I project managed this place myself and did a lot more work myself and ended up with a place that I really wasn't intending to because I had that much time. So does that mean that there were more things that you implemented that otherwise you might have thought, well, we'll go for the quickest route? I knew from the get-go that I wanted to have solar panels. And after they turned up, that's when I started to go down the whole, can I actually get this to carbon zero? It wasn't something I started out to do. I just wanted lower energy bills. What I ended up with, because at the time, and was watching lots of YouTube, um, I thought actually it's not a great leap to make this completely carbon zero. And once that's done, it's permanent. But I suppose that's the thing. Once you set yourself that target of zero carbon, I imagine you become quite competitive with yourself. Yes, it becomes a bit of an obsession because once the gas was disconnected, which was in June 2023, um, it was a bit of an anticlimax because I thought, oh, there's no gas and suddenly I'm zero carbon, but so what, effectively? And it was only after then that we thought, actually, we started, started off with being zero carbon, but what's our actual value here? And the value is, can we be sustainable? That has driven all the other processes, like the um, we don't use single packaging, anything's in our guest rooms. Um, we buy and make as much as we can ourselves. Mainly it's a better product, but just to save on the packaging that comes with it. Because the idea is that all the things here can be scaled. And I'm hoping that maybe a bigger company might come along and think, well, we can do what they're doing just on a bigger scale. Because nothing, nothing what happens here is rocket science. Your original motivation was to lower bills. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in lowering bills, that allows you to invest in some of these things that are a little bit more expensive. The granola here, for example, is more expensive, but delicious. But it allows you to have that trade-off, I suppose. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, it's a competitive market. I can't charge more money for being zero carbon. I can't actually charge more money for having homemade granola. But financially, I can make that work because my lack of energy and utility bills allows me a lot more scope to do things like the bread and the yogurt and all the other bits and pieces and keep it competitive. So when I get when people come to my house and want to see my hot water tank, which is surprisingly often. I can understand that. Well I open my little cupboard and there's a little hot water tank. Here, these are massive. I mean those are, and you've got two of them. They're two three hundred litre tanks. Uh, which gives me obviously 600 litres total capacity. Now, I was told I needed 800 right. for the amount of gas that I have. I've never run out of hot water because, especially with these tanks, you get to use the entire volume. Yeah. And the recovery is very, very quick. Yeah. And I can see in real time exactly what? what's happening. Right. So if I'm getting a bit low, I can always turn it on. Right. Or yes. actually set up the mixes itself to never go below a. A, a, certain, a certain minimum a percentage, yes, yes. Um, so once I got used to it, it's absolutely 100% fire and forget. Right, I right. I do not need to 
go to this tank other than to admire its pretty lights. Yes. <laughs> which I do more than I should. Yeah. But then the diff the big difference, obviously, between mine, which is for, you know, between two and maybe six people at a weekend or something at the most, mm -hmm. you're dealing you're dealing with between two people and how many? What's, uh, 16, 18. Si right. So and that, that can change in 24 hours. Yeah. Um, and it's always good to have the redundancy there. What I'm not doing is heating 600 litres of water to for 60 degrees, yeah. seven days a week, for two people. 365. <laughs> yeah. yes, which yeah. actually, which is what I was doing in the old place. Right. It was either on or, or off. it was off. Right. Yeah. There's no in between. I mean, I think this is the critical thing that I always want to repeat is these systems regardless of anything else, are, are more energy efficient than the old system. Forget whether it's gas and global warming yep. and central, uh, all that stuff. We're using this energy, you're using the energy to make this water hot in a much more efficient way with much less waste. For what I need. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. not what the system's forcing me to have. Yes. So the other thing I've got in my little cupboard is an eddy, which mm. controls that, which is a weird thing that I don't even know. It's doing stuff all the time. It doesn't tell me anything, but it's constantly controlling everything. And, and I've got two of them. You've got two eddies. <laughs> oh. um, why would I have two eddies? Um, first of all, the electricity is in three phases. Right. So I have one phase driving one tank, one phase driving the other tank, right. and another phase on the house. With the eddy diverters, if you have one, it'll heat one tank, and then it'll heat the other tank. Right. By having two of them, because I'm generating more than six kilowatts of solar power right. anyway, I can eat both tanks at the same time at three kilowatts right. each, which right. is basically maxing out the production I'm getting from, from the roof. From the roof. So everything I've seen so far, Javid, I sort of recognise, I know what it does, I know why it's there, I know what you do with it. This, total mystery, I have no idea what that is. That is a 400 litre cold water tank. Right. And the reason why I need it is, I have a standard domestic 25 mil water main connection coming into the building. Right. So it's like you've got single phase water as yes. opposed to three phase. <laughs> Purely <laughs> domestic stuff for amateurs. Right. So the water actually comes in there, there's my stop cop. Right. But it fills the tank. It is pumped out at three bar. Any time anyone opens the tap, it's coming out at three bar. Right. The, anywhere in the building. Anywhere right. in the building. Anything past this. So it also means that the central heating system never gets overpressured. Right, right. Everything is run at the same pressure, which is um, really good for my expansion tanks, the pumps, right. and everything else. It also means that with the taps and showers, everybody, you can open up all eight showers. I've right. never even thought of that. Yeah, I've got two showers and there's a, sometimes been... Arguments. And you've got to coordinate them, yeah, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> I can have all eight showers and all taps open at the same time. Wow. It will drain very quickly, but at least the pressure stays the same. Right. And because they're all, you know, water-efficient towers, as all of yeah. them are these days, they work best at three bar. Right. So right. I'm getting the efficiency there as well. And just for people who don't know anything about water pressure, it, you're on your average water pressure coming from the mains... I don't know what how many bar that is. Is that around three? That, that's around three. Right, so this maintains that even if yep. you're, there's more demand. So that air source heat pump, that is just for water? Is that is that what that does? Or? That will produce the hot water and the central heating for oh. the entire building. Oh, right. And it's got two big fans because it's a 12 kilowatt. Right, okay, that's a big fella. I I installed it obviously before everything was done. Right and took a bit of a guess. I've subsequently been told, after having done the heat loss and everything else, I could do the same thing to the building with a seven kilowatt. So that is, in fact, oversized? Well oversized. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. Um, what is even more interesting is, when I was getting the spec by gas engineers, they were telling me to have two of them. Wow. So I could have had 24 kilowatts worth of air source heat pump on two machines. I actually needed a small domestic seven. Wow. But then these two up here and those two over there too, are they specifically for individual rooms? Is that what their yeah. purpose is? Uh, the wall mounted ones are air to air uh, heat pumps. The way I use the central heating now is when it's on, which is only for five months of the year, yeah. it keeps the building at a constant 19, 20 degrees right. all the time. I've also been told by air source heat pump engineers that rather than heat every room individually is to open the entire system 
heat the entire building right. at a low and constant rate. That's what that does right. overnight on the cheap. And when we get guests turning up, they can increase and decrease their temperature. In their individual rooms. In their individual right. rooms. And that's what these... That's and that's what those, what those do. Right. Now, the solar on the roof. All together, there's 34. Right. Most of them are on the front elevation. Right. But what I did was put them on the sides, across the top, and down um, that side. And is that a wee east-west? Yeah. Way? Right. Basically, if I had a flat piece of roof, I put a panel on it. So then, and then over here, you've got the car chargers, which we're very grateful we used last night. It was really good. So two here, I will, I've actually laid cabling for another two right. because my belief is that over time, going to become more they're going to be more electric yeah, cars yeah. and as i said earlier this place is going to outlive me yes yeah and at some point you know 80 percent of cars turning up will be electric yeah. and we've got a service for that now you may ask yourself why is this old man lying on the floor looking at skirting board well it's not just skirting board this is thermoskirt the company that makes this this is a radiator skirting board this has hot water running in, inside it, like a, like a traditional wet radiator, you know, a big metal thing that's on the wall taking up space, means you can't put things next to the wall there, it's real pain to work around it. I can't stand radiators, I'm really sick of them. This is a brilliant alternative. So the whole room is surrounded by a nice warm skirting board and heats the room, really clever. In terms of payback period, that's a question that we get asked all the time. And I know it's quite a reductive question because it doesn't capture all of those other benefits that you've already described. But have you done the maths? What kind of payback period are you expecting? Done the maths, the maths keeps on changing because they, there are so many ways of skinning this cap. Firstly, I needed a heating system anyway. So I would have spent money regardless on something. So do I count that or don't I for a start? From a business point of view, I can wrap up the initial investment in the bank loan. So that cost is sunk and done day one. And that confers to me afterwards a much better cash flow. Because when I get to winter time, I'm not being crushed by big bills, which used to happen quite a lot. In raw financial terms, because the energy prices spiked so hard, my payback went from seven years down to less than four. Wow. And that has been reduced again because I found a great deal where I'm buying 90, more than 95% of my electricity between midnight and 7 a.m., basically in an economy seven rate. So obviously you started out in 2019 with perhaps a different vision from what you ultimately ended up oh, yes. with. But what would your advice be to your 2019 self and to anyone else who might be embarking on a similar kind of project? The advice I'd give anyone is do your research because there's so much out there. I actually only came onto Mixes Your Tanks, for example, by watching Just Have a Think, and that decision was validated by Robert talking to Peter Armstrong on one of your videos when you were talking to Mixes Your chief executive. And I thought, that solves me a lot of problems. I didn't wake up thinking, I want a smart tank. Mm. I woke up thinking, I need a hot water tank, what's next? The information is out there. So do your research and meet your installers and your engineers and first and foremost, trust them. If you don't, don't engage them. But now that you've gone through this process and of course there was heartache in there and of course it was a, a lot of work, but would you do it again? In a heartbeat. Other benefit that I ended up with, which purely only realised after it had happened was with the systems I have, I now have a lot of uh, resiliency. If the air source heat pump breaks down and can't give me hot water, the mixture tanks have heating elements, so they can kick in, or vice versa. If the air source heat pump breaks down and the central heating doesn't work, then the air-to-air -air units in each bedroom will give me heat. If the water fails, which it has done, we have the cold water tank to keep the building going. Because certainly in a bed and breakfast, if it can go wrong, at some point it will. Well, this has been an unusual episode because we got to stay where we were filming, which was really lovely. And I just want to quickly thank Javid and Judith, who've looked after us really well in this amazing, beautiful guest house. It's been so nice and also just really cool to see how existing domestic technologies can be put together to power and heat a 
really enormous building. Big building that can have a lot of people staying in it and using a lot of hot water. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, please do tell all your friends and family, particularly your annoying uncle who's doing up his house, to watch this because there's some really inspirational stuff going on here. It's worth, worth a look at. Uh, uh, that, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. If you have been. Thank you for watching.